Uh, no, he was a, a sports journalist for, uh, I think, 47 years uh, right. and has evidently uh, uh, started collecting his typewriters. Uh, was first a user I found on the web uh, in 1957. Uh, and then uh, his first professional journalist typewriter was an Olivetti 30, uh, Letter of 32 in 1965. And uh, he started collecting them, though, uh, in 2001. And just by the likes of just by lo looking at the timeline, I can only imagine that it resembles many of our collections. Uh, it swelled enormously and very quickly. And uh, at least at some point, it's, uh, I found that you had uh, over a thousand typewriters, which doesn't surprise me given the breadth of your collection and your writing. Uh, and just to say what you're talking about today, I'd say that one of the most interesting aspects of typewriter collecting to me is that relationship between the tool that we use to write and the product of, or the process of our writing. Uh, I'm a historian of 16th century Europe and the printing press is, is, is the key story in that. Uh, and how that affected uh, the way that people did research uh, and how they read and the just a, just the explosion of information that it, it created. And, and I am fully aware, as I think most of us who, who do any writing are, of the effect of word processors on our writing process. And you're going to talk today about a, a specific topic, which I think will help us understand that transition from the typewriter world of writing uh, to uh, uh, the new world of writing, which will go, I will, uh, it shall remain nameless, namely how the end of typewriters impacted on the quality of sports writing. And so now I'll hand it over to Robert. And like I said, uh, I'm here. If you need me, I'll be in the chat room. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Greg. It's all yours. Thank you, Greg, again. Um, I mentioned to Richard Polk just recently that uh, when I look at Instagram, I'm staggered by the things that people are doing with typewriters nowadays. And um, I feel a little bit off the pace, as they say in, in golf writing. So I've decided to talk about something I do know a little bit about, and that's uh, sports writing and the use of typewriters. You'll see I've uh, Put the end of typewriters in quote marks because, of course, for all of us here today on this um, wonderful uh, meeting that David has put together, we're all still using typewriters. They were actually, in our profession, were phased out uh, in the late 80s. The changeover for me occurred in 1988 at the Seoul Olympic Games. But I'll just start by um, looking at the tradition of, uh, of sports writing uh, with typewriters. Um, sorry. Uh, sports writers were dismissively regarded as fans with typewriters. Uh, this is an early shot of a group of journalists covering a baseball match with their typewriters. Um, Fans with typewriters, as I say, was a, uh, a dismissive comment because these people, one of the key things about these sports was that they were very, very knowledgeable about their sport and very passionate about it. And I think that's possibly one of the things that we are uh, missing in this present era. Another baseball scene, much later, of course, with typewriters, I think I can see a um, an ABC there, a coal steel, about two, three up from the bottom of the screen. And um, the Press Tribune at the 1964 Tokyo Olympic Games, you can see an Olivetti letter uh, being used there, uh, which is interesting because those games were in Tokyo, but at a time when um, Brother typewriters and other Japanese makes were just starting to uh, come onto the market in 64 and Olivetti had become an Olympic Games partner at the 1956 Melbourne Olympics and retained that in Rome in 1960 but by the time of the 1984 Los Angeles Olympics brother were a major uh, partner in the Olympic movement. Um, of my own personal 
uh, inspirations in sports writing. Uh, these are all American sports writers. Grant Rice, of course. Roger Angel, who is still alive. He's seen there using an Underwood uh, finger flight. He um, just turned 100 years old last September. And he was the author of The Summer Game, one of the great books on baseball history. The fabulous Reed Smith. You may have noticed behind David a uh, poster he has on, on his wall about um, there's nothing to writing, you just sit at a typewriter and bleed. Well, it was actually Reed Smith. It's often attributed to uh, Ernest Hemingway, but it was Reed Smith who came up with that line. Roger Kahn on the right there, he was the author of uh, The Boys of Summer, another great uh, baseball book. And um, my start in journalism, as Greg mentioned, was in 1965 in a small newspaper in New Zealand called the Grey Mouth Evening Star. And I was very, very fortunate to have as an editor, and the editor you can see on the right of the screen is a man called Russell Nelson. And Russell is actually at the very bottom left-hand side of the photo on the left, which is the Press Tribune at the 1956 Melbourne Olympics. And Russell was there covering the Games, the Olympics, for Reuters News Agency. Now, when I discovered that uh, this gentleman with that experience uh, was the editor of the local newspaper, that hyped my... Uh, determination to join that paper, work under him and learn something from him, uh, particularly with that type of experience. So uh, covering an Olympic Games became a major goal for me. And here I am on the left uh, in 1970 and in, in uh, covering a, um, a sporting tour in New Zealand with my own letter of 32. Just going back to Russell, I mentioned um, that uh, in 1956 at the Melbourne Olympics, Olivetti became the first typewriter company to become a, uh, uh, an Olympic partner. And uh, what they did was they supplied uh, uh, Studio 44s and uh, Letter of 22s to all the major, all the uh, press centres throughout, throughout the, uh, the Olympics, all the different sports. And at the end of the games, the Melbourne organisers were very apologetic to Olivetti and said, look, we're terribly sorry, but all the typewriters you gave us to, um, for the use of journalists have all disappeared, they've all gone. And Olivetti were absolutely delighted because that was their intention. And uh, what you had were uh, journalists who covered the Melbourne games taking those Olivetti's back to places, including the US, where they weren't that common at that time. And, um, and it was a huge uh, publicity marketing coup for Olivetti to do that. Uh, on the right of that photograph, uh, back in Auckland in New Zealand um, in 1990, and here you can see I'm now moved from typewriters, which I had done in 1988, over to what we call a NEC, NEC. And I'll go into detail about that change uh, as I go on, the um, the changeover for us occurred during the, as I said earlier, the 1988 Seoul Olympic Games. Um, we were using these uh, necks with a, a an old style telephone, and the caps you can see on the phone are what's called couplers. So what you did is you wrote your story on a neck you had only 14 lines on the screen. Um, so you had to scroll back and forward. And then once you completed your story to, to file it to your the computer system in your home newspaper, you dialed up a number uh, which put you through. You got a signal very, very similar to what many of you will remember as a fax signal. When you were faxing copy, you'd get a high pitched signal. And it was the same thing, same process. And then you would, once you'd got that signal, you would then send the story and it would go off your screen. Now, the gentleman you can see on your left has done something uh, 
that what a lot of us should have done, which is he's actually typed his story on one of those little brothers. You can see the little red brother. And he's typed it out and then retyped it into the neck because using these necks for us, these uh, early uh, laptops, were just absolutely fraught with, with uh, problems. And this is a key to, to the subject of my speech because for the first time, we found that we were, our minds were not wholly and solely concentrated on uh, writing stories, capturing the events we'd seen, capturing the atmosphere in the way that most of you will be familiar with is that your thoughts just pour straight through your fingers, straight through the keys onto paper in front of you. In those days when we used that method, after we'd written our stories, we'd get on the telephone to our home office, home newspaper, and read the story that we'd just typed to a copy taker who would be sitting in our newspaper office back in wherever it might be, in my case, London, Dublin, wherever. And they would take the story down on a, on a um, typewriter and hand it to the editors to be treated. Now, that was a fail-safe system. Um, first of all, you had no problems, obviously, writing a story just as you wanted it to be. Um, all the emotions that you were feeling all the knowledge that you had about a particular event would be poured through the typewriter and um, you knew that it had reached your your home office because you'd spoken to a copy taker, you'd taken the story down and you could be quite feel quite reassured. With the system uh, with, where you can see the coupler up there on the um, on the right now, for example, at the Solar Olympics, I actually had to bring in a, um, a blanket and a pillow from my room in the press village in Seoul because when you're sitting in a stadium with 100,000 100, or 110,000 people and there's a chair goes up, what happens is that that connection just cuts out and your story just disappears. Um, and so I had to find some means, some ad hoc means of overcoming that problem, the story would just disappear off the off the 14 line screen on your neck and you wouldn't know where it had gone to. Um, if, it, if you did succeed in seeing the story scroll off the screen uh, and you felt that it had reached its destination as, as described, you would then have to ring the newspaper and say, you know, have you received it? These were all sorts of technical worries, technical problems uh, that we had, bearing in mind that, for example, emails didn't come in until 93, 95, mobile phones, I didn't use one before 91. So with these early days, our minds we found were less concentrated on what we wanted to write and more worried that our stories were reaching their destination through these, uh, I'm sure you'll agree, they're fairly primitive methods. Um, if anybody wants to ask more details, bearing in mind those um, necks we used were uh, 16 KB ROM, 16 KB, and uh, they were called a PC8201. Uh, very, very primitive technology. And uh, not what I would call uh, a wonderful experience to make that change. I'd have much preferred, I should have taken a leaf out of the book of this gentleman who's been smart enough, as I said, to have written his story on a typewriter first in the normal fashion. And then at least then he would have a record of that story he filed down the, um, down the laptop, disappeared somewhere. Just to give you an idea, the 88 um, games were still very much typewriter Olympics. As I mentioned earlier, Brother had become the uh, Olympic partners for the um, Los Angeles Olympics in 1984. Uh, and they used um, their partnership with the IOC to promote their typewriters. And the images here, the one on the right, I'm afraid, is fairly blurry, but 
uh, it was one I took myself because I was um, quite taken by the number of typewriters that were uh, made available in each of the main press centres. So these two photographs are taken in press centres, media centres uh, at the um, at the Seoul Olympics. Um, I'm just going to quote a couple of people here to uh, express the point about the difference uh, between typewriter use and um, uh, writing stories with using more modern technology. This is a chap many of you will know, Tony Casalo, and he says that typewriters uh, are simply more practical. Um, they offer a distraction-free alternative uh, for producing a document. They challenge the user to be more efficient and see the errors on paper. Well, that's, that's one part of it. I think, as um, the British writer Will Self says, uh, using a typewriter forces you to think. Uh, of course, as I think uh, a lot of people would agree that one of the uh, distractions that uh, later emerged with uh, using computers to write stories is you, you quite often uh, get distracted from your thought process and uh, go looking online in the midst of writing a story and lose that, that flow that you had and as Self points out, the typewriter brings order back into your mind. And that's, it's very, very true from uh, my own personal experience. And uh, I, I now, as Greg mentioned, I now uh, return as much as possible to typewriting. I perhaps don't typecast as much on Oz typewriter as, uh, for example, Richard does. But uh, I, I still find it's uh, a huge advantage to use a typewriter when trying to um, express something uh, such as, say, for example, a, a major sporting event that you're covering. My experience, um, I, perhaps I could, as I mentioned to Jonathan on a uh, podcast last weekend that, oh, by the way, I should explain to you why I'm wearing this PJ top. Uh, typewriter PJ. It's actually quarter to four in the morning here <laughs> and it's a wee bit chilly too so please excuse I, my own experience of being at Herman's, Herman's gatherings is that people like to dress up especially Herman so I thought I might dress up for the occasion too. Um, just going back to what I was saying to uh, Jonathan on the podcast my experience would be classically to be in a stadium where an event would end at 4 p.m. and I'd have a 5.30 deadline. So I had 90 minutes to write between 1,300 and 1,500 words. The thing about those words that was that I had to write analysis, uh, not description. The people reading my story in the next day's paper, the Sunday papers, would have watched that event on TV and would know exactly what happened, who won, who lost, so my uh, assignment was to tell them not what happened, but how it happened. And going back to the earlier point about fans with typewriters, to be able to do that, you really need to understand and have a deep knowledge of your sport and to be able to analyse uh, what just went on in front of you and also to capture you know, what the, what it meant, what the atmosphere was like, what the emotions were like, to get all of that into a story. And that's where those earlier American type uh, sports writers that I mentioned, the like of Red Smith and Grantland Rice in particular, was so brilliant and such an inspiration to people such as myself, because that is the type of writing that was encouraged in American newspapers. American newspapers definitely led the way in terms of, of, of good sports writing from at least the 1920s right through to the, um, the era of people like Dan Jenkins, who I didn't mention earlier. Uh, and so they, that, that was the start of writing we all aspired to if you, if you wanted to make your way in the profession. 
as Greg mentioned, I was in the profession 47 years from 65 till 2012. And it was half and half. Half of that time was using typewriters. Half of it was using uh, the more modern technology such as laptops. And it, it, the, the pleasure in it, the excitement went out of the job. That's why in the end I took early retirement at the age of 64 um, because it, 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 there was no fun, there was no enjoyment and there was deep frustration in the way that newspapers were handled largely on economic lines uh, with the emphasis going on to online newspapers. Way back in 1980, um, when computers were first coming into newspapers in Australia, um, the uh, journalist union, uh, the Australian journalist union, wanted a 70.5% loading on their wages to use computers and management were only prepared to pay 7.5% and it went to arbitration and in the end after a month-long strike by journalists right across the country, uh, the 7.5% loading for, use, for using computers was agreed on. And in a funny sort of a way, you can equate that to the reality that we found, that it was at least a 7.5% difference, if not more, to the way we, we operated, the way we approached our task, and the way we were able to execute um, story writing, uh, which, um, as I say, if you look today at modern sports writing, it, it really doesn't compare with the colour and the depth that you got in the days when, uh, when you had uh, people using portable typewriters. Uh, today, if you go to a major sports event, what happens is that they have a press conference afterwards. The teams involved and the officials involved decide who's going to attend that press conference in terms of the competitors or managers. The journalists have no say in that. Uh, and yet the journalists now rely almost 100% on quotes that come out of that press conference. So there's no analysis, there's no real colour, there's no in-depth look at the event itself. Stories are simply based on what's said in press conferences and that's really not sports writing. That's just because a lot of these press conferences that you hear, uh, what's said is really pre-scripted uh, and doesn't give you an honest appraisal or an honest insight uh, into uh, what's just, just not taken place. Um, I think I've, I hope I've made my point here in that. Um, so I'll go back to Greg and ask uh, him to open it up to questions because um, some of you may have a, a few things you'd like to uh, flesh out in the points I've just made. Thank you, Robert. Uh, I, uh, I started the introduction before uh, 1130 as it turns out and I hope that everybody realizes uh, uh, who, who, who you are uh, and uh, and also if you have a question you can uh, put it in the chat uh, and somebody actually asked me a asked me a question directly I think to ask you this was Glenn uh, did Robert cover the women's 3000 meter race at the 84 Olympics between Zola Budd and Mary Decker that collision yes I was there and um, uh it was it was uh, an event that uh, evoked a lot of uh, mixed feelings because, of course, um, Zola Bud was a South African, and uh, South Africa were still under the international sporting boycott at that time. She represented England in, in LA. Um, I think it was a simple mistake, and um, Mary uh, Decker, of course, tripped and fell, uh, and we, uh, you know. There, there have been other instances in Olympic and Commonwealth Games, Empire Games history when uh, that type of thing has occurred. Um, I, one of the saddest things was to see John Walker tripped up uh, at the Auckland Commonwealth Games in his own home city in 1990 
uh, one of the greatest milers in the history of athletics uh, to fall flat on his face before his own crowd. So I guess it's just one of those tragedies, if you like, in sport that something like that could happen and uh, did happen. Does anybody have a question they'd like to, to ask directly? If not, I'll have one, but I want to let other folks go first. Can you end yeah. the screen sharing? Sure. All right. Um, yeah, I have one. <laughs> um, I, I, I was wondering, you were talking about the quality of sports writing. A good friend of mine, um, our age is a sports writer. Um, I understand where you're going when you talk about modern sports writing. It's not the way it used to be. My son calls what we do debt tree journalism. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, but real journalism still exists. I mean, the real writing, sports writing still exists, but it's changed. It's, it's a, an evolution of covering the game and writing for people who haven't seen it to going to the story behind the game and doing the real analysis by interviewing people, talking about what drives them. And it, it just changes. Yeah. There's still you're good sports right. writing out there. Yeah, you're quite right, Paul. I mean, the best sports writing you'll find there, obviously, is in magazines or, uh, you know, Sunday. It's not in daily, daily newspapers, which is really what I was, um, I was concentrating on. But... You're quite right. I mean, um, this Sports Illustrated are still running some fabulous um, stories. But the big the point I was trying to get at is with time constraints, when you're up against deadlines for, say, Sunday newspapers or evening newspapers, um, to be able to put together 1,300 words in very quick time and be quite confident with what you've written, um, then... Uh, the magazines, people have weeks, if not longer, to write that copy. Uh, yeah. We were under, yeah, we were under extreme time pressures to get that sort of stuff out. And um, I used Seoul, to work for the Associated Press and another news agency, and the message was always the opposition had five minutes ago. <laughs> um, I um, I did notice that. Um, with the, as I mentioned, Sports Illustrated earlier, there's an article, it appeared one year ago about the brush shoe in 1968 and how the IAAF came to ban it so quickly. And it's absolutely fascinating stuff. And it's, it's taken an enormous amount of research and time to write it. But uh, it's not the sort of thing you're likely to find in a, in a daily newspaper any longer, unfortunately. Apart from that, it's great to see you again at Herman's. Yes, it's good to see you again. <laughs> and thank you for your ongoing help with my uh, attempts to uh, restore typewriters. <laughs> Without you, I don't know what I'd do. <laughs> Who else has a question? Okay, I will ask a question. Oh, go ahead, Richard. Uh, yeah, I guess my question was going to be, how much Robert thinks um, that need for instant news has has harmed reporting. But from what you say, maybe it's it's always been there, that pressure to, to deliver as quickly as possible. Yeah, I think instant news is different because of, uh, you know, social media. And um, what I think tends to happen now is people are going off what I would describe as half cock. In other words, not being in full possession of all the information, all the knowledge they need, but being under pressure to file something almost instantly, um, rather than having, in my case, say, 10 minutes or 15 minutes to think about it before I started to type. Um, I remember uh, the instance I referred to earlier, um, it was a particular event in, at a stadium called Twickenham in London. And uh, I came straight out of the press box, sat at the typewriter, and a chap beside me said, don't you want to think about it for a few minutes? I said, no, I know exactly what I want to write. And, uh, and it, it just poured out of my fingers and it was 
if I say so myself, it was a good match or four. But um, m mostly you would you would get a little bit of time to think about it and gather, um, you know, gather your thoughts a little bit, which I don't think is happening so much with, with um, social media today. Any other questions? I'm, I'm curious, you, you described a moment when the technology, the modern technology actually seemed to impede the writing process and that you were worried more about getting the, the story transmitted to its location at, uh, than you were. At some point though, uh, the modern technology, you probably didn't think as much about that. And I'm still wondering about the, the just the techne, the, the craft of writing. And did you ever notice a moment or did you ever notice a change in the way that you began to compose that was based on your ability to immediately self-edit as opposed to typing, um, which is what yeah, we all well, deal with, I think, as self yeah. people who use word processors. Yeah, I suppose, Greg, you could say I was scarred by that experience in Seoul um, because uh, with only having 14 lines on the screen and it scrolling up and down, um, that process... Um, uh, was a was such a major change and it caused such angst for all of us using it because a lot of us were using it for the first time. But I, I still think that in any writing process, no matter what it is, using a typewriter is still preferable. Um, it, I mean, with, with if, if you're filing directly into your newspaper office's computer system from a laptop, um, mistakes can and do occur. But if you're typing something and then reading it to somebody, taking that copy down, the mistakes, in fact, there were about three tiers of checking copy. There was, apart from yourself reading it, writing it, reading it, the copy taker taking it, the editor going through it, all of that was, it was checking details and checking spelling and checking uh, uh, that type of thing, style, uh, which doesn't occur because the introduction of computers, as I said, was all about economics, which was taking out those people who were doing that job, taking out copy takers, taking out editors. I see people today um, with headphones on doing an interview while typing on a computer. I mean, we would just never dream of doing that. We would take notes and then transcribe those notes or pick pick through those notes and pick the highlights out of them before writing a story. Now what we're doing is... Yeah. I just wanted to say that we're about to get kicked out. I think uh, okay. there's less than a minute left, but uh, uh, I just wanted you to be able to finish your thought. Sorry I interrupted you there, but uh, no, I want to thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I want to thank you for getting up so early or staying up so late, whichever it was. <laughs> And I hope that we'll see you later in the day, uh, yeah. maybe after you've had your sleep. Uh, and uh, thank you so much. Appreciate you. Thank you, Craig, very much. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. Thank you.